All right, let's take our Bibles, if you would please, and go to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to uh, be covering part 2 of a message I did last Sunday night on getting to know your enemy. Because there's a lot we need to know Amen. about our enemy. Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Where, uh, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Amen. And that's where we're at, folks. We need to do all to stand. It means it's going to take everything in you to stand. Think about that. That's 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 kind of puts you on. A real sobering level where we're at against our enemy to do everything that we possibly can to stand which means we need to have that in our mind that he is that he is that interested in destroying us that we have to keep our wits about us constantly that we can just simply do all to stand Against the wilds. I think I, I just think about that. I just it, it, it's 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 mind blowing about how you know you look down through history, uh, at, at, at especially at those that have persecuted the Jews, and and you think, oh my heavens, how can one person be so bent on destroying an entire race of people? How how can one person be that be that motivated to wipe their existence off of the face of the earth? And that's your personal goal. And yes, that is Hitler that I'm referring to. But that is exactly the plan. The, the plan of Satan is to wipe us off the face of the earth. To destroy us, to make us useless. And as I said, we're not doing a full study on angelology or demonology, but I want to give us a little bit more insight into the personal work of Satan as forewarned is forearmed. You can be you can be armed now because you've been made aware. You know, if the watchman gives the warning. It's up to the people to do with it what they will. If you don't seek shelter, if you don't, if you don't use the warning to your advantage, and this forewarning, think about this. All the money that goes into trying to predict uh, tornadoes and, and, and severe weather and earthquakes and all of these different things, they try to predict these things so that people might have a warning in order to get to safety. And everybody seeks after these people except for the God called preacher. That's one warning they don't seem to want. And it's the worst warning that you need. It's the worst form of destruction you can have. Yet they don't want to hear the mouth of a God called preacher to say, hey, you have an enemy that wants to destroy you. Well, I want to forewarn you of some things so that you can be armed and ready to use what you do have. That you, you can continue to stand. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we, we find this analogy that Satan's compared to as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. That is his style. He is in predatory mode constantly. That's not something that we're used to, to really thinking about. Even if you look in nature, even lions themselves, they, they're always said to be up and active for a few hours of the day. 
Most of it is spent laying around. But when they are up and running, they are in predatory mode. They are seeking for food. They are out to kill. Because that's how they live. But this is, this is an analogy that lets us know that the devil is not one of these characteristics of the lion. He's not laying down for 20 hours a day. He's roaming constantly. He is constantly in predatory mode. Everything on planet Earth has to have sleep. Everything on planet Earth. They have times when they come out when they're more active and times when they have to be asleep. He doesn't need sleep. He can just be out and destroying. You know, and, and it's, it's crazy to think about that. So we have Satan's desire. He is our adversary. We need to realize we do have an enemy. And a, an, an adversary is one who has enmity at heart, which is pretty much hate mingled with disgust is what enmity really is. Hatred, extreme hatred and disgust mixed together makes up what we would call enmity. And he's got that in his heart. He has hatred and disgust for us. He has hatred and disgust for God. This, this goes beyond our reason. This goes beyond our little finite minds that we think of that anybody can possibly really be disgusted and hate, hate God that way. But he does. And so do, do the millions of angels that follow him. A whole third of the host of heaven followed him in hatred and disgust against their creator. That is astounding. And they have one goal, to hurt God. Now, we know, and they know, that they really can't hurt him because God is all-powerful. He gave them whatever powers that they have. He can take them away and will one day take them away. But what we must understand is that how they really hurt God is by hurting what he loves the most. They go after what he loves the most. That's how they hurt him. Because they know they can't physically do anything to God. They, they know that they can't, you know, overpower God. You're not going to do that. Not everybody in heaven together and everybody on earth together could overpower God. But they go for the object of his love. Something that is so precious to God that he sent the, the Lord Jesus Christ to die for these people. That they would be there with him. That is why we are the target. We're the target. We're not the target because we're something... Uh, overwhelmingly sensational and, and such a threat to them. You're not a threat to them. You're not on the devil. I mean, has anybody ever had Satan himself appear to you? Anybody? That means you're not that big of a deal. I haven't either. That means I'm not that big of a deal. Let's, let's think about this thing. Now, his influence, we know, is everywhere. But he is going for us, not because we're something that's a threat to him, but more along the lines that it's the only way they can hurt God is by destroying us. Because God's reputation, unfortunately, is represented by us. You know, it's it's amazing when you when you when you think about when you think about how everything is structured in our world. You know, and, and somebody's reputation is all put into a credit score, and then they look at those numbers, and then they, that, that's what they build your, your, your reputation as. That's basically what it is. 
There's nothing worse than, than to have to go and, 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 and try to do that and then have them look at your numbers and then find out, oh, well, we don't want you. Right? I mean, that's just how it is. But those, those numbers are said to be so important because those numbers are the ones that everything that you're judged by when anybody looks at them. But guess what? We are God's credit score here. His, his reputation is in us because we reflect him. Our scores reflect our personal choices, habits, and whatever, whatever else is there. But God's reputation is supposed to be held by us. We are supposed to be giving him a good report by others to watch us. And unfortunately, we don't do so hot. We don't do so hot sometimes. A lot of times we do better than, than other times, but we ought to realize that. The world will still look at you, and they will judge God by you. That's how it is. They're not going to care about your backstory. They're not going to care about, you know, circumstances at the time. They're not going to, oh, oh, well, you know, they've got a lot on their plate. And there's all this other uh, mitigating circumstances and different things like that. They're not going to look at all that. They're going to say, that's a Christian. Well, I don't want no part of that. Unfortunately, that's what happens. Oh, that's a really nice spot. <laughs> I may preach from back here. Warm in here. But what we have to understand is we are <laughs> to be representing God in a great way. By us being hurt, it hurts him. Okay, let's talk for a minute about Satan's danger, this roaring lion thing. We need to realize that he is formidable. He is a formidable foe. We are no match for him ourselves. It is the Lord that has to rebuke him, not us. And I, I mentioned last, uh, last week how not even Michael the archangel would even bring an accusation against him. Michael's the top dog of the angels. He's the top of the heap, leader of the pack, whatever you want to say. Michael's up there. He's up the angelic chain, so to speak. He is the arch, the archangel. And he wouldn't even accuse Satan. Think about that. We do far more with our mouth like we're something else. We, we lay charge to the devil all day long. We do things that angels wouldn't even do. That ought to scare us a little bit. And we're quick with our mouth, but we're not too sharp with our mind. Because Michael knows what Satan can do. Don't forget, Michael witnessed what Satan pulled off in heaven. Because it was Michael and the other two-thirds of the angels that had to cast them all out. In that war in heaven. We're no match for him ourselves. His disposition, the devil. Here's some of the descriptive names given to Satan in the Bible. First we have the devil, one who slanders and falsely accuses. Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a great voice in the heaven saying, Now has come uh, the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren has been cast out who accused them before our God day and night. We have Satan. He's called Satan, which is one with one who withstands. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Jehovah. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Listen, we got to understand there, when he's standing before the Lord, he stood before the Lord to resist the cleansing that was taking place. He does not want you to be clean. He does not want you to be pure. He doesn't want you to be holy. He doesn't want you to do what's right. He doesn't want you involved in all of that. He wants you to be useless. And unfortunately, 
Most Christians seem to fulfill the devil's will in their life over God's will, and they render themselves useless. They don't pray. They don't come to church. They don't serve the Lord. They're all about being saved, and then they go their own way. They do their own thing, and they don't give God another thought. These will be rendered useless. There won't be anything for them here. The dragon he's called. We see power and cruelty. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice ye heaven uh, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the heavens of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knoweth he hath but a short time. See, he already knows when he came he had a short time. That ought to tell you time is short. If when the devil comes to the earth, he knows he has a short period of time. That's a short period of time. And we see Lucifer, which is light bearer. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And it goes on to talk about how his, we, should, we should marvel also that his ministers also should do that. Remember, Satan can come as a beaming, white, beautiful angel, uh, and, and so can all of his ministers, and they can draw, draw you astray. They can, they can transform themselves. So I want to look quickly at three things that he desires to do tonight. Satan wants to, these desires to happen. Number one, Satan wants... To damn the lost. He wants to make sure that every person go, that can possibly go there goes to hell. See, he knows he's going. But see, the more people he can get to listen to themselves and not God and go to hell. See, he doesn't care. He, 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 it's his plan to destroy you one way or another. He doesn't have any of this thing. It's only to hurt God. Can you imagine something so vicious that it doesn't even care about anybody who's involved, anybody that's not involved, anybody innocent bystanders, so to speak? He cares nothing for all of that. He doesn't even care that he's going to hell himself. He's just going to take everybody he wants to just to hurt God. Think how vicious someone would have to be to not care. To not care. When you, you know, not everybody's a bad, bad person. I mean, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all born lost. We all have that knowledge. But listen, when you look into the eyes of, uh, of these children that are growing up, it, 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 it speaks to your heart. You know, your heart goes out to these people. You see people in need. You see people suffering. You see people hurting. Your heart as a Christian will go out for them because of the fact that you hate that they're going through such a thing. And there's compassion that's there. He possesses no compassion. He don't care. He doesn't care about the hurt. He doesn't care about the pain. He only cares about hurting God. That is it. That is his goal. That is his ultimate goal. He wants to see the, 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 the lost remain lost. God made man for salvation and for restoration, for fellowship. For heaven. Right? He wants it to be in heaven, not in hell. Satan wants to see their minds deluded. We know that in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He wants them blinded to their need. He wants them blinded. He wants them to reject the love and the sacrifice of God, of Christ. Satan wants to see their bodies destroyed as well. Job 20, 11, his bones are full of the sin of his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. 
Psalm 38, 7, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. He destroys their mind through sin. He destroys their bodies through sin, and he destroys their happiness through sin. Sin is the downfall to everything you don't want to, everything you don't want to lose, you can lose by sin. Joy, happiness, peace, contentment, you name it. If it's a good thing, it can be taken away because of sin. You can lose that. Thank God you can't lose salvation. Salvation is the only thing that we're guaranteed that we can't lose. But you know what? We rob ourselves because it is us that... That brings about this sin in our lives, and, and we don't we don't purge it quick enough. We don't stand guard and realize that oh, I see that trap. I'm not going to go step in it. As a matter of fact, maybe you know, like those old bear traps. Maybe I, I've seen old people like that, uh, the old mountain men, and they'll, they'll they'll take a big stick and they'll throw it over there on that trap and they'll spring the trap so nobody else gets hurt by that trap. Because they've already seen it laid. They already know where it is. We can pay attention. We can be a lot better off. If we can really pay attention. That listen. This sin that you love. That you want to hold on to. That, and, and nobody likes to think that. Well that's a sin and I'm holding on to it. But you know what? If it's against something. that the, if, if it's either something God told you not to do. Or you're not doing something God told you to do. That's sin. If a man knoweth to do good and he doeth it not to him, it is sin. And if you hold on to that, you are choosing that sin. You are choosing to have all these things pulled away from your life. The joy, your salvation can't be lost, but its joy certainly can. David knows that. Read Psalm 51. He knows all about that. He knows all about blood guiltiness. He knows all about having that sin ever before him, ever on his mind, ever robbing him daily of anything that's good and pleasant. That's what he wants. Satan wants to damn their souls. Revelation 20, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. He's going to blind them of the reality of hell. Oh, it's just a, and, and most of the time he wants to just make it seem like it's a big old party. Oh, come on down. We're all going to open up some beers and we're going to have all the drinks and the party and the good times and the laughter. And that's what he wants people to think hell is. If people knew what hell was, they would want no part of it. That is our job to illuminate them through the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. Listen, this is not a party. And I want you to understand something. I, and I, I told the, uh, I've, I've heard Pastor tell uh, Pastor Dr. tell this story about a, a funeral that Dr. Bernard McCarty uh, uh, was presiding over. And it was a really rough crowd. It was the drinking party crowd. Man, they lit up that funeral home with rock songs and just tributes to their friend. And it was just a wild, it was just a wild thing. And he got up. And he stood right by that casket, and he looked out into that crowd, and he said, "You wake up! The party's over!" And he pointed right at that, right at the person in the casket. This is reality. There's no party in hell. And he opened it up, and he often would use. He he loved the reasoning with God. Uh, tracks always was out knocking on doors and passing them out 
And he took that he took that track, and many of those people accepted Jesus Christ as a personal savior. Some people sometimes people just need to know the party's over. The party is in your mind, and what you're partying over isn't factual. Your idea of what and what your perception of what hell is is not what hell is. It's time to be serious. It's time to wake up. And it's time to know the truth about it. What you do with it after I give it to you, that's the same thing. When I, when I, when I get up and I preach the message, I've, I've done all that I know to do. I've done all God's asked me to do. It's now out of my hands and into yours. You must choose what you will do with what you hear. Will you apply it or is it going to go in one ear and out the other? Same thing is true when you go witnessing. When you're, when you're taking somebody and you're trying to explain to them the gospel of Jesus Christ and they won't hear you, it is now out of your hands and their blood is upon their own head. They have not rejected you. They have rejected the one who sent you. Right. That's something you need to understand. <laughs> Many of us already know that. <clears throat> Satan, secondly, wants to defile the saved. He cannot touch your salvation, but he can destroy both your life and usefulness for God. He wants to defile your testimony. 2 Samuel 12, 14, How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. He causes the lost to blaspheme God. He causes the lost to perish without a witness. See, we must be careful, and we, we haven't been enough. We, I, I, I already know. I already know this. This is something you get right into that thing, and you think you're going to witness to somebody, and then you think, oh, I, I don't do that. that last little bit of, of, of hold on, don't do it, that's not of God. That's right. That's not of God. That is just the voice of influence. And you know who influences you more than anybody else? You. You will take your own over anybody else's 99% of the time. But that fear, Satan's influence will use that voice. Oh, I, oh, I don't know, but what if they, but what? Get rid of those buts. Get rid of those conditions. Get rid of those what ifs. Get rid of those things. And just go and say, hey, can I give you some good news? How you can know right now if you die, right now that you'd be in heaven. It has nothing to do with church. has nothing to do with religion. God gave his word to everybody. And he just wants you to know. How hard is that? It's not hard. Carry them. Hand them out. Tell somebody. Satan wants to destroy your usefulness. 2 Timothy 4, 10. The first part of that verse says, For Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. See, he'll lead the saint astray. Now, you'll, you'll be familiar that we used to have a course that was set according to the prince of the power of this world. That Satan, he had a course set for you. When you get saved, you get a whole new course, bless you. You get a whole new course set by God that's going in the other direction. But sometimes when we take our little paths of, oh, God's wow, getting a little too holy over here. Get a little too, uh, it's getting a little too religious this way. I, I'm not just trying to go this way. You end up back on that other path. Going back away from God. The path that leads away from God is the one the devil had for you to start with. You've made it back to course A. That's not where you want to be. Course A is not where you want to be. 
And that's what happens. See, we're so protective over ourselves. We're so protective over what we like to do, what we want to do, and what is fun to us. See, fun is okay. You're looking at a fun guy. I like to have fun. But listen, the world isn't all about that. I had to give up a lot of things that I thought were fun. There's things that you have to give up if you want to walk with God. But it comes down to it, is the fun more, is the fun better for me, or is what God tells me to walk away from that? What if God takes you away from what you thought was fun? Then how are you faring with him? Are you still walking and deciding to follow Jesus? Are you going, oh, I, I, don't, I don't see what's wrong. That's the first step toward path A. I don't see what's wrong with that. You're questioning God. You don't necessarily need to see what's wrong with it. If God says it's wrong, the Spirit is leading you away, you hear it from the Bible, and a lot of times we hear things we don't receive them, like I said, because we're a natural voter, or whatever the case may be. We don't want to accept that this is wrong because it's, it's, it's my little pet project. I don't want to walk away from my pet project. Do you realize how many people would be Christians if they weren't addicted to drugs and alcohol and and, and all those different things. They don't want to become a Christian because they're afraid that they're going to lose their good times. There's a sad account of a story of, uh, of when, uh, when my dad worked for advertising and he went, he went to, the, he, had to, he had to go to this beer company to work on this ad and he couldn't help well, when you work for the newspaper, that's where you, you gotta go where they send you, right? So. He went there, but he was, able to, he was able to witness to one of the truck drivers. And, uh, and that truck driver said, man, I've got, to, I've got 25 years. He said, if I can save it, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, I can't drive this beer truck. I'm going to lose my retirement. See what I mean? I don't know what happened at the end of that story. I don't know. I pray to God that, that that witness, that maybe while he was riding down the road, that he prayed and he accepted Christ. And that's what I want to believe happened. But see, he's going to use those things. And it could just be even something like that, even your job, even, even whatever, else, whatever else that you want to hang on to. God says, let go of it because I want you to go here. I want you to do this. I, I don't know about that, Lord. I don't, I don't see why this is so wrong. You don't. You know what? You need to understand that we are bought with a price, and when God says go, you go. When God says do, you do. When He says give, you give. When He says stop, you stop. When He says get out of there, you get out of there. You don't need to worry about. It. He sees what you don't. Amen. He knows what you don't. Right. It's important for us to understand that and not, not bring ourselves into dis destruction. He wants to lead the saint astray. He wants to expose their sin to the world. Listen, the devil not only wants to get you hooked on doing sin, but he wants you to do it all out in the open. He wants everybody to see you sinning. Because what, else, what What? could that possibly do? Hurt God. Hurt the church where you attend. Scars on the reputation of a church. Over and over and over we've seen it happen. People fall into sin and it's the church's name that is drugged through the mud. And they almost never recover almost never recover from some of these devastating things. It's hard to overcome. I knew of one church, uh, the, the, the pastor, the pastor did something very, 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 very bad. 
Let's put it that way. And it was so bad, he probably should have been in jail. And I think he, I actually think he did get arrested and put in jail for it. But then that church was broken. And everybody that heard the name of that church associated it with the sin that went on. And, you know, uh, and that kind of falls back to what you were talking about this morning, Brother Speck, about Eli and his sons and doing wickedly. And the sons were doing the wickedness, but he was wicked because he didn't stop them. He was wicked because he didn't stop them. And it ended up taking the life of him and his sons. But it brings shame and reproach on the house of God. Oh, I've got, I've got so many things that I can tell you, but time will not permit me this evening. Satan wants to destroy your happiness. John 15, 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, your joy might be full. Psalm 51, 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and hold me with thy free spirit. <laughs> See, Satan lies about the glories of the world. All that glory he offered Jesus, it was not his to offer. We can't offer God what's already his. You just give it back if he's let you borrow it. He lies about the glories of the world. He reminds you of your spiritual failures. Satan wants to destroy our posterity. He wants to destroy our kids. Psalm 127, 3 and low children are the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. See, he doesn't want them trained. He wants them left alone. If you leave your kids alone, that's what he wants. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't want them to do anything to have any use for the Lord. But kids, they need like we do. We're no different than our children. God has to discipline me just like I have to discipline my children. Like you should have to discipline your children. They need correction. They need compassion. They need consistency. They need conviction. He doesn't want them either saved or useful. He'll do anything to stop it. Satan wants to destroy your reward. 2 John 1 8, look to yourselves. That we lose not the thing, those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Thirdly, Satan wants to divide the church. Because a house divided cannot stand, and he knows that. So he wants to divide the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye uh, all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you by brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. I want to throw out a few causes of division that he might use. Church division comes through carnality. We have to understand that it comes through carnality. James 3, 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. All it takes is a little confusion to open the, the door to every evil work. Strife and envying and confusion, all those things are a bad batter mix that, that lead to some really nasty things that can go down. 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Church division also comes through biblical ignorance. Through biblical, uh, through biblical uh, ignorance. Ephesians 4, 
2 through 7, with all holiness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given the uh, grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The church division comes through false brethren. In 3 John uh, chapter, uh, uh, in verses 9 uh, through 11, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and himself... Uh, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Acts 20, verses 28 through 31. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock also of your own selves, shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Church division also comes through satanic influence. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage uh, of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. These, the results of division are this. Division destroys the fellowship of the church. You know, people will sit in the pews of the church with malice and unforgiveness, and they're just like Achans. They, do, they sit there, and that's what they do. It also destroys the commission of the church. Missions have been damaged because gaining a family, losing a family through spiritual nonsense. Sometimes that stuff happens because people just don't seem to uh, exercise sense anymore. Division destroys the testimony of the church. We covered that. It destroys the, the, the children and the posterity of the church. They both see and, and, and hear the ungodliness that's even happened, you know, in, in the hallways. And they see the adults acting just with no sense. They're not going to have no sense either. We have to be that example of sense. And a lot of times we don't give that the way that we should. Division destroys the worship in a church. You get this undertow that just feels like it's canceling out any good that's going out. And, and uh, I've, I've felt that many, many times that we, were, we would be trying to push for something and just feel this drag, this drag, this undertow that just seemed to almost wipe out anything that we were trying to do. And, and I've seen that both both, you know, in, in the churches and, and, and as we traveled, you go in and you'd sing. I remember one time my uncle, he said that they went with the, what he sang with the royal ambassadors and they got up to sing. And he said, Dave, he said, I it felt like absolutely that there was an invisible force field and nothing left the platform. We could not get out there to them. And it, it, it turned out that there was actually a satanic presence in the church at the time. And that was why. Because he stopped everything and he began to pray. And he began to plead the blood of Jesus Christ in that place. And somebody got up screaming and ran out of the church. He said once that person left. That force field was gone. We got up. We, we started singing. People were crying. They were weeping. They came to an altar. People were getting saved. God did something huge in that place. Do not think because we are in the day in which we live that something like that couldn't happen. That's 
why we as God's people need to stay close to Him. We need to keep the presence of the Lord so strong, no demon would come within a thousand miles of this place. Amen. That's what we need to do. Division will destroy the worship of the church, the evangelism of the church. It will hinder the prayers of the saints. It damages the believer. It will divide you from your pastor. It will divide you from the pulpit. It will divide you from the people. It will divide you from the peace of God. It will divide you from the place, which is God's house. It will divide you from the purpose, which is God's harvest. It separates us from so much. Division brings reproach on the name of Christ. It brings confusion of the church's person. Purpose, it brings reproach on the testimony of the local church, and it all ultimately damns sinners to hell because they, they can't they can't get the light of the gospel. Because you know what? If we don't, if we're not if, if, if we fall for his devices, how can we help other people? When you're trapped, you can't help somebody else. You need to help. So if you need somebody to help from the outside that's not in the same pit you fell in. There's been times in my Christian life I've, I've fallen into those spiritual pitfalls. I needed help to get out. I couldn't get myself out. No one in there with me could help me out either because we're both stuck to the same things that are keeping us to the floor of that hole. You have to have somebody help you and pull you out. So we need to know, our enemy, that it's a very real threat, and it's a very real issue, it's a very real problem, and it's getting worse because time is shortening. Have you ever been running? What, anybody else like kind of start getting really stressed out when you have somewhere that you know you have to be? And the time is getting away from you, and you know you're going to be late, or you know you're. There, it doesn't that get stressful? Yeah. You get a little stressed, you get a little upset, you get a little frustrated, you get a little mad because I, I just want to get there and I can't. Right? So we're, we, we get frustrated that way. But the more time that goes by, the devil is increasingly frustrated and increasingly more violent and mad and just in total slaughter mode because his time and if at the time of the writing when it said woe to the inhabitants of earth for the devil has come down and you have in great wrath and knowing because he has he knows he has a short time imagine from the time of that writing till now how much more of a threat that he is how because he's got even less time now I believe that we are very soon upon the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil knows that, you know, when Jesus comes back to set up the kingdom, that he's going to be bound up for a thousand years and shut up in that pit. Man, that's going to be some good times. Amen. That's going to be some good times because he'll finally be shut up. That's what we need from the devil is just have him shut up in a bit, locked up, locked away. Man alive. Let's have the invitation. I don't know how the Lord spoke to you tonight, but if you were at all doubting or unsure of what you face as a Christian, man or woman or child, teen, wherever you fall into it, I hope that God revealed that to you what it is that he really is after you, is after us. He doesn't want to see this church grow. He doesn't want to see us get closer to God. He wants little petty things to divide us, to get us off, off track. And we need to be like Paul in forgiving anything as Christ forgives anything to us that we don't give him an advantage. We need the advantage, amen? That's what we need. So as you, as you pray, as we open up uh, the altar for prayer, uh, I always 
I always mention the fact that the altars are open because that's what they're made for. They're made for Christians who want to just talk to God. Just because somebody doesn't come, someone comes forward doesn't mean any anything in particular about why they come forward. They could just be they have loved ones that they need saved. Maybe they want to be a part of seeing those people saved. Now more than ever, we need more people praying vigorously and fervently. Because that's going to avail much to us. It really will. I want to invite you to spend whatever time with God that you need uh, this evening. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the message. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us to realize more about our enemy. Lord, you know my heart. I, I, I don't like preaching on the devil. I'd much rather preach about you. I'd much rather preach on something that, 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 that makes us feel wonderful and, and joyous and, 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 and just out walking out on just the spiritual high. But God, it would be unwise for us to go out these doors and be ignorant of his devices. If by some measure of grace, somebody may be saved from a terrible trap this week that the devil has set for them as he's lying and wait, laid and wait. I pray, Father, that you would just give us the wisdom to see, the spiritual sight to see that which is before us, that we can do the right thing, that we can follow you, that we can do right. Please help us meet the needs of your people now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.